from our agenda today. Nonetheless, people really may come and show up, they can enter from the back entrance. You, you must have been warned that uh, we have a guest lecturer today. Uh, he is a guest professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Medical Psychology. Professor Michael Mass from the University Chularongkorn in Thailand, Bangkok. He is biology in Belgium, but uh, he's currently employed there as a full professor. Uh, and uh, he has been uh, affiliated with our department for all the last three years. Uh, as guest researcher and guest professor. His field of study is biological neuropsychiatry. And uh, today he will uh, deliver a topic on biomarkers of affective disorders. Now, let me introduce you to Professor Mass. Uh, this is uh, a representative sample of the fifth year uh, graduate students in medicine who are taught in English language. If, uh, if we are about to follow the full list, uh, it is uh, no more than 30% of the population. <laughs> but this is a typical attendance. Uh, I don't know what, how is it in, in, in the institutions you, you've been involved with previously. Uh, but uh, the fifth year attendance is typically decreased in, in this country since no lecture classes are mandatory. Good news is all 20 students uh, out there are really committed uh, and are not going to disregard any of your messages and uh, any of your, you know, take home, uh, take home notes. Uh, now I, I suggest we uh, will give the floor to Professor Mais, uh, who has prepared uh, um, a presentation uh, with uh, the length of uh, one hour and a quarter, giving uh, space and time for you uh, to invest tell uh, your questions. I don't really understand why you do sit here, I'm Catherine. Because I have to leave earlier, unfortunately, and I don't want it's to It's a disaster, it's a disaster. This is the most committed student uh, that uh, I, I personally encounter from, from these groups. So, the curse thing in the background is very important. Unless you finish at 345. <laughs> Uh, so the floor is yours, Professor Mas. You, you have been equipped with a remote. You need to switch it on. Make sure it works. Very good. Okay. So today I will speak about, uh, as you can see, about biomarkers, biomarkers of affective disorders, and as you know, affective disorders that's uh, bipolar disorder and depression. But first of all, I will start with some immunology. I hope you know immunology because it's very complex. And as you can see, when there is an injury or an infection, then there is an activation of some immune cells, macrophages, monocytes, and they produce, I hope you know this, they produce cytokines. Okay? So, for example, they produce interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor. And those cytokines, in turn, can activate the helper cells. And the helper cells, in turn, will become activated and produce other cytokines. So, TH1 cytokines, like IL-2 and interleukin-1. Okay, so you have to remember this. That's very important for the rest of the lecture. And then we start, because indeed depression and bipolar disorder are immune disorders. They are simply immune disorders, such as schizophrenia. What do we have? So here you see, we, I will show you data on cytokine concentrations in serum, especially interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF, are increased in depression. Then I will speak about the acute phase response in the liver, because depression is what you can see in the liver. It's true, you can see in the liver. And then I will also show you some data on complement factors. And here you see the cytokines, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF, that induce the liver to produce proteins. 
and you know that, for example, CRP, C reactive protein, have to block in some of those uh, acute phase proteins. But the cytokines can also work on the brain to induce depression, induce anxiety, induce fatigue. So they work on the liver and they work at the same time on the brain, inducing mental symptoms. Okay. Good, let's start with this. That's uh, the interleukin 1 system. Interleukin 1 beta and the interleukin 1 receptor antagonist. So, what's happening? You, here you have interleukin 1, so one of the pro inflammatory cytokines, can bind to the membrane and induce pro inflammatory signals. So, it induces inflammation. On the other hand, when the interleukin 1 receptor antagonist is present, can be present in the serum, it binds to interleukin 1 and it decreases the signal of interleukin 1. So that's interesting. So at the same time, when there is inflammation, we have an increase in interleukin 1 and an increase in the interleukin 1 receptor antagonist. One is pro inflammatory and this one is anti inflammatory. So at the same time, we have an inflammatory and an anti inflammatory response. Now, what do we see in depression? In depression and in bipolar disorder, we see a huge increase in interleukin 1 as compared with normal controls. So both uh, bipolar depression and major depression are accompanied by increases in interleukin 1. So there is a pro-inflammatory response in those affective disorders. Then uh, the interleukin 1 receptor antagonist, which is released together with interleukin 1, as you can see, that's a meta analysis, is significantly increased in depression and also in bipolar disorder. So you see, at the same time, we have an increase in interleukin 1 and the interleukin 1 receptor antagonist in depression. So there is a pro-inflammatory response and the factor is also an anti-inflammatory response. Good, here we have the second one, that's tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha. And TNF alpha is also a pro-inflammatory cytokine. And as you can see, it can bind to different receptors. The TNF receptor 1, the TNF receptor 2, it binds. And then there is a uh, signaling. And that's a pro-inflammatory signaling related to many different disorders. It's related to depression, to schizophrenia, but it's related also to rheumatoid arthritis, to psoriasis, to COPD, um, to Parkinson, to MS, and so on. So many inflammatory or immune disorders are characterized and in part mediated by TNF alpha, as you can see. Now, those receptors can be released in the serum, for example, the TNF receptor 2 can be released in the serum, and there in the serum they can bind TNF. Then you have a complex between uh, TNF and the receptor. And it means that those receptors act as a decoy receptor. So these act as a decoy receptor, decreasing the signaling of TNF. So at the same time, we have again an activation of the TNF system. TNF increases, but with inflammation, TNF receptor 2 are released and can decrease the signaling of TNF. Pro-inflammatory and at the same time anti-inflammatory. So what do we see in affective disorders, in depression and bipolar disorder? Again, that's uh, TNF alpha significantly increased in depression and in bipolar disorder. And as you can see, this is a publication by Mikova <coughs> et al. in 2001. And that's the first publication ever on TNF alpha in affective disorder. And it comes from Bulgaria. So that's the Pope Sophia. Together with me, we published those data in 2001. <coughs> and you see, uh, the findings were uh, replicated by different uh, authors. For example, here we see the controls, patients in a manic episode, patients who are depressed, and again, the TNF alpha concentrations are significantly increased in manic patients and in depressed patients. Good, that's number three, the third 
pro-inflammatory cytokine, interleukin-6. And this you have to remember well in your career, because I think within 10 to 15 years, psychiatry will become immunology. That's my idea. So, so <laughs> that's what I think. So you see, when there is an immune response, for example, induced by bacteria, first, TNF increases. A little bit later, interleukin-1, and a little bit later, interleukin-6. So there are three phases in the immune response. Now, interleukin-6 can bind two receptors. The interleukin-6 receptor leading to signaling. It's called classic interleukin-6 signaling. This is anti-inflammatory. It's protective. So very complex. You will see the interleukin-6 receptor this one here can be released in the serum and can bind to interleukin-6 and they form a complex and this complex induces also the signaling. But this uh, signaling <coughs> is called interleukin-6 trans signaling and it's pro-inflammatory. You see the immune system is really very complex and um, in depression we see and also in uh, mania and also in bipolar disorder, depressed type, we see indeed an increase in interleukin-6 as compared with healthy controls. Even more, here you see that treatment-resistant depression is an immune condition characterized by increases in interleukin-6 and other cytokines. So also treatment-resistant is related to um, inflammation. Now, interleukin-6, as, as you can see, is involved in many different disorders. So, we found increase in interleukin-6 in Parkinson, in MS, in Alzheimer. The aging process is characterized by increase in interleukin-6, psoriasis, uh, COPD. So, all those immune and autoimmune disorders are characterized by interleukin-6. And um, here you see the, all the effects of interleukin-6. So when interleukin-6 is increased, there is an increased classical interleukin-6 signaling, which is, as you can see, neurotrophic. It's protective, it will protect the, the neurons. But um, also the interleukin-6 trans signaling can be increased, and the interleukin-6 receptor also increases. And then you can see, first of all, the acute phase response. You see reactions in the blood-brain barrier, because it can be become permeable, more permeable, due to the interleukin-6. It's related to TRD, I showed you already. It's also related to autoimmune responses in depression, that sometimes we can see. And it's also related to some other um, activities, such as an increased cortisol axis. You know, depression is also characterized by an increased cortisol response. Well, this is in part mediated by an increased interleukin-6. Okay. Good. Then, in the liver, I told you, there is an acute phase response. So, um, there are many different uh, acute phase proteins, and you know CRP, antitrypsin, acid glycoprotein, also decreased in albumin and transferrin. These are also acute phase proteins, negative acute phase proteins. For example, here, we see the haptoglobin levels. In simple major depression, melancholic depression, uh, minor depression, and healthy controls. And as you can see, many patients with depression have high values above the upper limits um, of, the, uh, of the range of the normal range of haptoglobin, showing that 50% of those patients have inflammation. They have a peripheral inflammation. Okay? So, and the, the mechanism is indeed when the cytokines are increased, interleukin-6, interleukin-1, TNF-alpha, they can induce the liver to produce CRP and uh, haptoglobin, um, antitrypsin, acid glycoprotein, and they will decrease at the same time albumin and uh, transferrin. So, we see many different uh, findings in depression. Um, for example, haptoglobin, I've told you already, is increased. The IgGs are increased. Fibrinogen is also increased. It's also an acute phase response. The complement factors 
are significantly increased and also hemopixin, that's the iron binding protein. So you, you see the whole tableau of um, acute phase response, of the inflammatory response. But apart from this, there is also an activation of Th1 cells. Do you remember? So first of all, we have the monocytes. They produce interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and TNF. Those cytokines activate T helper cells. They become activated, and they release other cytokines, interleukin-2, interleukin gamma, which stimulate the monocytes. Cell-mediated immunity, so that's called the cell-mediated immunity. Now, interferon, as you can see, is significantly increased in depression as compared with normal controls. And after treatment with uh, antidepressants, it decreases. Neopterin, look here, that's a product of monocytes after stimulation with interferon gamma. So interferon gamma stimulates the monocytes to produce neopterin. Neopterin is highly significantly increased in depression and bipolar disorder as compared with controls. So it means that there is activation of monocytes, activation of t helper cells. Okay? So it's a picture of inflammation and immune activation. So last year we published a meta-analysis. So Kohler is the first author, and then some of my friends are included. And um, it's, uh, as you can see, we looked at all the different cytokines published from 1990 until now. For example, interferon gamma um, increased, interleukin-12 increased, the interleukin-2 receptor, which is a TH1 uh, component, also increased, and then um, also increases in interleukin-6 and in TNF-alpha. Look at this, so there are many, many studies on interleukin-6, and they are very consistent, so there is an increase in interleukin-6. Same thing with TNF, I think all these studies are very consistent and show indeed that there is an increase in TNF in uh, major depression. So here we see the first one is Bulgaria, number one, Sofia. Here I was the first one to publish the data on interleukin-6. And now it comes, a little bit more difficult, a little bit more difficult. So we have the monocytes. So they produce interleukin-1, TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, and they can induce the acute phase response. But, I told you, they can also induce T-helper cells uh, to become activated. So activated T-helper cells. Also, those cells can become activated to TH17 cells. Those can induce autoimmunity, so you can call it autoimmune cells. And then, and that's interesting, there is another part so the T0 cells can transform into T regulatory cells. And they can transform into TH2 cells. And that's interesting because those are immunosuppressive. So here we have inflammation. That's an inflammatory response. That's immune activation, T cell activation. And here we have an immunosuppressive component. So we call it the compensatory immune regulatory system, or the six. So you see, when there is an immune response, there is activation, inflammation and immune activation, but at the same time, there is also suppression. So why, why is it? It's to achieve an equilibrium, a balance between inflammation, immune activation, and then, of course, the immune suppression. So there is a new uh, balance in the cytokines. And, and depression and bipolar disorder are characterized by also increases in interleukin 10, one of the immunosuppressive cytokines, also characterized by increases in the interleukin 1 receptor antagonist, remember, immunosuppressive, and also increases in the interleukin 2 receptor immunosuppressive. So it's difficult, huh? because those factors are increased in depression and bipolar disorder, and they show, they indicate immune activation, but they function as immunosuppressants. Okay? 
So here we see the meta-analysis of interleukin-2 receptors significantly increased. The interleukin-1 receptor antagonist meta-analysis significantly increased. And here we see interleukin-1, I think, no, interleukin-10 is also significantly increased. So you see the, the three major immunosuppressive cytokines or receptors are also significantly increased in depression. And now it becomes interesting because what's happening with the, the staging, you know, this work is the staging of depression or the cause of depression, staging of depression and bipolar disorder. So we have recurrent episodes. Most of the patients have recurrent episodes. So here we see, for example, the first episode, there are trigger factors. Trigger factors can be, I will show you later what the other trigger factors can be. So we have the trigger factors, they induce immune activation and inflammation, but as a reflex response, there is directly also activation of immunosuppressive factors. After some time, there is remission. And you know, many patients, if not all, achieve autonomous remission after six months or nine months. And probably what's happening here is that the CIRS counteracts the immune activation, leading to a normal or more or less normal immune system. Then, when there is a restress, what we see is that there is a higher response in the immune system. So there is a, what we call a sensitization in the immune system. So upon restress, there is a hyperactivation in the inflammatory response system, but again, counterbalanced by the CIRS. Okay? And then remember, that's interesting here, I will show some slides on this, antidepressants activate the CIRS. So antidepressants have immunosuppressive activities. I will show you later some slides on this. Good, but because we speak about biomarkers, I have some slides on biomarkers too. As you know, there are different kinds of biomarkers. So we have mechanistic biomarkers, we have clinical disease biomarkers, and therapeutic biomarkers. Okay? So if you go back to, the, to this slide, so what we found is an increase in S cytokines, we see an increase in six cytokines, so this is a mechanistic biomarker. Mechanistic means we are looking for the mechanisms, the mechanisms of the illness. So our cytokines show that depression and bipolar disorder are accompanied by inflammation, immune activation, and immunosuppression at the same time. So we know the mechanism. So these are mechanistic biomarkers. But of course, it's also interesting to have clinical disease biomarkers. We have some, not in psychiatry, not yet, but we have, for example, glucose for diabetes. So glucose for diabetes is a mechanistic biomarker, but also a clinical disease biomarker. So best is to have the two at the same time. So then we have, then we know something about the mechanisms, and we know something about uh, the diagnosis too. Because indeed, one of our aims is to predict the diagnosis. Okay? We want to predict the diagnosis. Now, here I have a new data set just analyzed this weekend. So we have patients with major depression compared with bipolar disorder. And that's the cytokine network. And as you can see, on this profile, for in bipolar disorder is completely different from major depression. So it means that major depression and bipolar disorder are two different disorders. They are completely different with respect to the immune system. Now, these differences can be used to predict who belongs to MDD and BD. So for this, for example, we use, as you know, the sensitivity, the specificity, the predictive value of the positive value. You know those things, I'm sure, sensitivity, specificity. And for example, here, the difference between the two groups, you can see sensitivity, 99, 7%, specificity, 
96 components. <coughs> That's much better than glucose for dry ingredients. Much better. So we have a really very good panel here to differentiate the two uh, illnesses. Also, we can use a rock curve. I'm sure you know that. A rock curve to diagnose and to know the uh, relationship between sensitivity and specificity. So the higher uh, the rock curve area of the rock curve, the better the diagnostic performance. As you can see, the AUC area under the rock curve for this discrimination is 996. So it's almost perfect. Okay? So it means that probably we can use those markers to differentiate bipolar depression from major depression. But um, there is more. Nowadays we use machine learning techniques. So we use, you know it, machine learning to differentiate uh, groups from each other. So this uh, is uh, published some weeks ago. So we have normal controls and we have patients with major depression and we have some measurements of uh, interleukin-6, interleukin-10 and then opioid receptors. Opioid receptors which are related to the immune system. First thing you see is that everything is increased in depression as compared with normal controls. But then we want to predict major depression and to use a model or an algorithm to predict major depression. And therefore we are using pattern recognition methods. Or we are using that is synonymous supervised learning methods. And these are all different kinds of machine learning. Okay? So the first step in machine learning to detect new biomarkers is this one here. So that's a principal component plot. That's a factor analysis. So we take all the data here and we put them in a factor analysis or a principal component analysis. And then you see the display of all the cases, all the patients in a two-dimensional space. So now, what do you see? You see here the depressed patients. And here you see the normal controls. And you see that they are well separated. So they are really two different groups. Those are come together here on this side of the display and these here. So these are really two different groups. And now the next step is to find a model to separate them. And we have different methods to separate uh, the patient groups. The first one is support vector machine. Anybody knows this? Yeah, really good, good. As we are. Support vector machine. So you see here what's happening. Huh? So we have one group, then we have another group, and we take a few subjects or patients close to the uh, the margin here, and these are the vectors. And based on those vectors, here there will be three, yeah? so this one, this one, this one, we compute a new plane discriminating the two groups. So we look at the best plane to differentiate the two groups based on the biomarkers. And for example, that's what you have then. That's an outcome of the SVM. We have also the accuracy. Accuracy is sensitivity and specificity, so it's an average of the sensitivity and specificity. And as you can see, it's 100% in prediction. So it means that when we use this model here, that we computed on those five biomarkers, we can predict who has a depression and who is a normal control and who has a bipolar disorder. So you see, we can use the biomarkers, the immune biomarkers, to discriminate the patients and predict who has a depression or a bipolar disorder. And so there are many more um, machine learning techniques. So th that's another one. And this one is called soft independent modeling of class analogy. It's called also SIMPA. You should remember that because it's an important uh, machine learning technique. What it does is, so we have different groups of patients and we build a model around the patient, so that here it's an ellipse, around the patients. These are, for example, normal controls, bipolar patients, depressed patients, and you see in the space, it's a multivariate space, you see three different ellipses, which are really 
discriminated from each other by a large distance. And then you can say, okay, those groups are completely different classes with respect to the biomarkers. And that's true, so we can see it on the different displays. And what is more, we can also look at the discrimination power of the biomarkers. So here we have an ID from on the power to discriminate between the different groups. And as you can see here, interleukin 10 is most important, and then the opioid receptors. So you see, we can use those methods for, first of all, to predict a diagnosis. And we will predict with 100% accuracy, 100% sensitivity, 100% specificity, and in addition, we see the features, because these are the features of the different groups, discriminating the groups. So this is a prediction, and this is learning from the model. So we learn from the new machine learning models. Okay, so that's one other technique, and I stop with the technique because of many more. But this one I like too. So that's uh, neural networks. That's something uh, very interesting. Why neural networks? It has nothing to do with neurons. Except that um, they say uh, that, that the connections work like neurons. So I will tell you what's happening. We have the biomarkers. These are the input layers. So we put the biomarkers here. And then the model computes some specific algorithms in a hidden layer one. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So we have a different combination of those biomarkers. And then in another layer, they are mixed again with different formulas. So we have different algorithms, and those can be used to uh, predict, and really predict the diagnosis. So here we have a very uh, complex system. It's also called deep learning, because we go indeed very deep. We look at the interactions between all the different biomarkers, and that's important. It's not one biomarker, in itself that is important, but the interaction between many biomarkers. So, for example, this I did uh, this weekend. So we have the MDDs and the VD patients, you remember, so there is a strong difference between them. When you look with ANOVAs of T tests, then this one looks the most important, TNF receptor 2. Also this one is very important, that's interleukin 12. Also, the pink one is important. That's another side effect, ST2. But after the neural network analysis, we see another picture. So the most important is interleukin 6 in combination with interleukin 12 with the TNF receptors 2 and 1. You see, the outcome of those machine learning techniques is different than and using simple ANOVAs or T-tests. Good, but then we go on with the uh, oxidative stress. So, first I told you there is activation of the immune system, there is inflammation, but there is also oxidative stress. You know something about oxidative stress? Yeah, yeah, second year? Okay, so we will... Uh, yeah, good, good, good. So we have, uh, first of all, um, oxidative stress. So here we have reactive oxygen species. Toxic, huh? very toxic products. And we have the antioxidants. And normally, there should be a balance between the two systems. Enough antioxidants to counteract the activity of the reactive oxygen species. Here, that's a very nice slide. You see what antioxidants do. Antioxidants destroy the reactive oxidant species in the plasma, in the membranes, and also in the center of the cell. So you see directly the ROS, so the reactive oxygen species, have many effects outside the cell, in the cell membrane, and also in the nucleus and the cytoplasma. They can destroy the membrane, they can destroy your DNA, and they can destroy, uh, for example, also the mitochondria, in the cytoplasma. So, the, because the, the ROS has many different, you see it here, has many different actions. 
we have to look at this. So, when there is an increase in oxygen species to the good, that's this, uh, then the polyunsaturated fatty acids can be damaged and they form aldehydes. Aldehydes are very toxic products that can attack your DNA and destroy your DNA. Then, ROS can bind to can damage LDL cholesterol and HDL cholesterol, leading to oxidized LDL. Important then because this is the start of arteriosclerosis, cardiovascular disorders. Yes, that's true. ROS, together with NO, nitrate oxide, can attack proteins and damage the proteins and form what we call protein carbonates and 3 nitro tyrosine. As I told you, can also attack the DNA, leading to other biomarkers. So you see, there are different pathways in the reactive oxygen species, leading to damage of lipids, 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 proteins, DNA, and also microbiome. In fact, the ROS can destruct everything, and they are also neurodegenerative, so they have also an activity on the neurons. And so, I think this research started in, if I remember well, we did it in uh, 94, 93. So, first of all, we found that there is a decrease in HDL cholesterol, so that's the good cholesterol, as you know. So, there is a decrease in HDL cholesterol, which is related to immune activity. So, when there is a new activation inflammation, the HDL is damaged, in effect, the concentrations decrease. Secondly, we also found that LCATS, uh, lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase, is significantly decreased in depression. That's another antioxidant enzyme, very important, to protect uh, the HDL cholesterol from damage. And also, vitamin E is decreased. So here you see that all lipid-associated antioxidant defenses are decreased in depression and in bipolar disorder. And even in family members of bipolar patients and MDD patients. So it's a genetic trait. Good. And so we are speaking about lipids. Then we speak also about omega-3 and omega-6. <coughs> you know the story about omega-3, omega-6. So here we have omega-3. So it starts with LNA, and this is elongated to APA and to DHA. On the other hand, here we have LA, and this is elongated to arachidonic acid, for example, and other uh, different uh, PFAS. But you see the difference. This one, you can get from walnuts, from fish oil, and flaxseed oil. This one, look well, from soybean oil, and corn oil, and meat. I will show some more slides about this too. But why is this so important? It's important because the omega-6, and this we see here, right? the omega-6 are pro-inflammatory. They induce inflammation. They induce pro-inflammatory cytokines and prostaglandins, whereas the omega trees are anti-inflammatory. They decrease inflammation. They decrease immune activation. So, what is the what do you think about this? It means that the ratio between omega three and omega six is very important. When you have a low ratio, it means more inflammation. When you have a higher ratio, it means protection against more inflammation. So that's uh, that's very important. Yeah, you have to remember, especially this one here. So you have to eat or drink flaxseed oil. It's very good huh? I take it daily because it's very healthy. Or you can take salmon, two to three a week, and also good. And you have a good omega three content in your uh, blood. Or cod liver oil. But this is not so good. So. Uh, but no, so this was in, uh, I think, 95. We discovered that uh, depression is accompanied by a decrease in omega-3 as compared with normal controls. So all the omega-3 
contractions are decreased in the blood of patients with depression. Also, they are decreased in the brain, in postmortem brain, for example, they are decreased, and also in fat tissue. So it's, there is a general decrease in omega-3 in patients with depression. And um, let's look at the next slide. That's important. And uh, this was published in The Lancet by one of my friends, Joe Liblin, from the National Institute in uh, Bethesda. You have to look at this. So what he did is he looked at apparent fish consumption. You can compute this. Huh? And then he computed the fish consumption in different countries. And then he made a correlation between those two factors. And he found, whoops, a negative correlation 0.84, that's a very strong correlation. So, what does it mean? It means that in countries with a low fish consumption here, United States, West Germany, New Zealand, also Australia is here, Canada, France, <coughs> you see, there is a higher incidence of major depression. In countries with a high intake of fish oil, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, Less depression. You believe it? It's true, <laughs> it's true, it's, uh, it's a correlation, how we know well. Not only with uh, major depression, the incidence of major depression, but here we, you see uh, postpartum depression. Also, postpartum depression is related to seafood consumption. Again, protection in Japan, in Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia. Here, South Africa, Brazil, Germany. Yeah. The, these countries are not so good to live in. You see a low intake of fish oil or seafood and a high rate of postpartum depression and depression. Yeah. And I can s show you the same slides for suicide. Also, suicide is related to a decrease in uh, omega 3. Why could this be? Because, okay, omega-3, but omega-3 is very important because you have the membranes of the cells. And you know the membranes of the cells are, what is it? These are lipids. Lipids, we have cholesterol, we have the polyunsaturated fatty acids, the omega-6 and the omega-3s are all there. And the omega-3s are needed for the flexibility of the membrane. So those omega 3s are needed for the expression of the receptors. So for example, your serotonergic receptors depend on omega 3. If you have a low omega 3, then your membrane will change and the expression of your serotonergic receptors, LMDA receptors, and so on, will be disturbed. So you really need omega 3 to have a functional membrane. But when we got three decreases, you have a problem with the membranes. Aha, the countries with a very low omega-3. Let's have a look. Yeah, of course, here. Yeah. US, Brazil, yeah, of course, very low uh, omega-3. India, but also uh, Europe. You see, Europe is not good at all. Bulgaria is here, so I think there are no data on Bulgaria. But I think when we look at Turkey, Greece, and that Serbia, I think it's the same. I think it's also not so good in Bulgaria. So I think there's a low omega-3 uh, in uh, Bulgaria too. The good countries, so if you want to have a good omega-3, you have to move to Greenland, Alaska, and uh, Norway. Okay, there you have a good intake of omega-3. Of course, the Eskimos, yeah, what do they do? They eat, or they fish, Good. We have other antioxidants which are decreased in depression. Here, for example, you see zinc. So zinc is another strong antioxidant that is uh, decreased as compared with controls. But also folic acid. So that's a meta analysis of folic acid. And also folic acid is decreased in patients with depression. So you see those uh, antioxidants are very important for depression because when they are decreased, when you have a decrease in zinc, when you have a decrease in folic acid, and omega-3s, 
then you have decreased protection against cross, and then you can have this, that's an increase in T bars, or we call it MDA, malonga aldehyde. So that's an aldehyde formed by lipid peroxidation. Very dangerous product. It can attack uh, everything. It can attack your membranes, the lipid membranes. It can attack your DNA. So um, when this is increased, it can have many different uh, side effects. And indeed, as you can see here, it's increased in depressed patients, many patients, schizophrenic patients, as compared to the controls. Now, here you see what's happening. When the cells are dying, and this we have regularly, yeah, so when we, when we have an infection, our cells are dying around the bones, or around the infection. Uh, and then you see on the dying cells there is an expression of MDA. So it's expressed on dying cells. It's expressed on L, LDL uh, cholesterol. And then you have an IgM, so it's an autoimmune response against the MDA. And then this whole system can be engulfed by the uh, phagocytes. Okay? So, but, but, but what we see down here is an IgM, autoimmune response against MDA. And also this one is significantly increased in depression and in bipolar depression. So it means that this whole system of engulfment by phagocytes or the binding here or the IgMs is not functioning well because there is this escape of autoimmune responses to MDA. So it means that we have really an increase in MDA in patients with depression and in bipolar depression. And uh, even more, so we, we published a paper that there are very strong differences between controls, okay, but also bipolar 1, bipolar 2, and MDD patients in oxidative stress. You have to look at this, so that's very interesting. MDD show a profile, and these are all different oxidative stress measurements, including lipid peroxidation and including protein oxidation strongly activated in depression. So you see it's terrible. So those patients really suffer from oxidative stress. This is much higher than bipolar 1. So there's a difference between MDD and bipolar 1. But even more, bipolar 1 show another profile than bipolar 2. So it means that we have three different classes here. We have MDD is different from BB2 and BP2 is different from BP1 and BP1 from MDD. So these are really different disorders with respect to their autophysiology. So remember this. Even more, when it comes together with GED, you know, a generalized anxiety disorder, then we see this. We have depression with GED, and that's something terrible. They show really very high values of oxidative stress as compared with bipolar 1, bipolar 2, and as compared with healthy controls. That's really the most uh, terrible situation you can have, the combination of major depression and GED. Then there is a very strong uh, oxidative stress presence. Okay, oxidative stress, but I can make it more difficult if you want. And then we go to nitrosative stress, that's something else. It's related, but it's not the same. What is nitrosative stress? You should know that because that's biochemistry. So, you know, because <laughs> it's the binding of NO to tyrosine, for example, or tryptophan, or whatever, amino acid. So, but it's a nitrosal group. It's not NO2, it's NO. So here we have nitrosal tyrosine, and when we look at uh, all those nitrosal products, they are really increased in depression and in bipolar disorder as compared with uh, uh, normal controls. And this you can see here. So this we will publish, it's submitted now, and uh, you can see the profile of the nitrosylation is the same between bipolar 1 and MVD. But again, it's completely different from BP2. 
So, so really, BB2, you have to differentiate between BB2 and BB1 because these are different designs. And it's even different from MDD. And those people are in a depressive episode. So it means you cannot make a differentiation on clinical basis because the depression is more or less the same. But you see here, with the nitrosative stress, oxidative stress, with human activation, you see huge differences between those different groups. Now, is this important in the nitrosylation? Yes, that's very important because when you have a small, a minor nitrosylation, it's neuroprotective. It will protect your neurons. But when it increases more and more and more and more and more nitrosylation, then it becomes neurodegenerative. It will attack your neurons, destroy your neurons. And thus the system is related to Parkinson disorder, it's related to MS, it's related to Alzheimer, and we see also to depression and bipolar one disorder, but not bipolar two. Good, then, um, okay, I was speaking about uh, inflammation, immune activation, oxidative stress, and now the question is, what are the sources? Where does it come from? You have it, so depressed patients have it. But where does it come from? Now it becomes interesting. So we found some genes, TNF genes, interleukin-1, interleukin-6 genes. They are related to depression and bipolar disorder, also schizophrenia. Of course, people with now with over battery will develop uh, depression. They have the vulnerability to develop depression. Then you have lowered zinc, selenium, that's another vulnerability factor to develop depression. Smoking, toxins, psychological stress. Okay, so I will show you some of those different uh, sources. Let's start with psychological stress, so that's interesting. Psychological stress. Here we have the day of an examination. So I took really students, medical students, of the fifth year, I think you also the fifth year. So when you have an examination, you will see that something happens here. I will show you what happens. So we have baseline levels, one month before examination, examination, and then one month later. So what we see is, so we measured here the IgGs, no, the gamma fraction, and here the IgGs, and we divided the students in two groups, those with anxiety and those without anxiety. And I can tell you, 50% of the students have high anxiety. High levels of anxiety, really. High levels of anxiety. And then you see, in those people, in those students, that the gamma fraction and also the IgGs are increased. So there is a specific response to psychological stress in the immune system related to stress-induced anxiety. But also, your cytokines will increase. So same thing, we have baseline, student's baseline, the student's examination stress, and after the stress. Again, the students with anxiety. You see increases in interferon gamma, increases in TNF, and it's not a little bit, it goes up from 20 to 80, 400% increase. Interleukin 10 increases, and also interleukin 6. So it means that psychological stress, not a very severe <laughs> psychological stress can induce an inflammatory response. But I think more important is this one here. That's the what we call the ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. This you know, huh? So it's also called early lifetime events. And then you see also yeah, the most important are physical abuse, physical neglect, emotional abuse emotional neglect, sexual abuse. Those factors are strongly related to depression and suicidal attempts. So for example, the number of those ACEs, so for example, one, two, three, four, has increased with suicidal behavior. The more you have, the more suicidal behavior you will show. There is a positive correlation between early lifetime events 
and suicidal behavior, but also with depression. So here you see the incidence of depression. So it goes up, so the incidence of depression is related to the number of those adverse events in the uh, early childhood. And it's more in women than in men. You see, yeah? But, 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 then we look, and there are also differences between normal controls and between bipolar patients and depressed patients. So bipolar patients and depressed patients show more ELTs, adverse lifetime events, than controls. Highly significant differences. When we combine all those factors in machine learning techniques, then you see a huge difference between controls, BD, and major depression. So it means that early lifetime trauma death are related to depression and to bipolar depression. Sexual abuse is more related to BD than to major depression. So that's a difference between those two, these numbers. And then what we want to do is to look at the correlations between adverse life events and uh, the outcome of depression, what we call the phenomenology of depression. And this we do again with machine learning. So that's another technique, and it's called SMART PLS. And it stands for Partial Least Square Analysis. Okay? So that's a fantastic technique. What we do is we look at pathways, how input variables, so for example the ELTs or the biomarkers, can affect output variables. I will show you. I hope it's in the next slide. Yes, so it's this one, that's fantastic. So what we did is we measured the ELTs, five ELTs, we brought them together in a factor, that's with factor analysis, and then we predict all the different outcome variables of depression. And you can see the ELTs are related with uh, income, even income, eh? they are related with the CGI, they are related with uh, disabilities, with the quality of life with suicidal attempts, suicidal ideation, even the drugs patients use can be predicted by the ELTs. So uh, subjects with many ELTs will be, you can see that, will be you see, treated with antipsychotics. They will be treated with mood stabilizers. So especially those patients will receive antipsychotics and mood stabilizers. And that, what is interesting, is that there is here another, that we call it, a latent factor, that's a latent factor or a factor, and it comprises the number of depressions, so the staging of depression, the number of depression. It contains two, you can see, two biomarkers, antioxidants, so that's an antioxidant, I will show you, it's called POM and HDL. And also the manic episodes are included. So, the number of episodes and one of those antioxidants form one vector. And then you see the ELT influences this. So it means that ELTs also induce the recurrence of depression and of bipolar disorder. ELTs are directly related to the number of episodes, so to the staging of depression, together with the antioxidant enzymes. Now, what is this antioxidant enzyme? So that's uh, HDL, I told you already, bound to POM, and it's called paraoxonase 1. So paraoxonase 1 is, uh, yeah, you can see it, it's uh, connected, it forms a complex with uh, the HDL uh, cholesterol, or the HDL particles, and when it is lowered, when this what does it do? First of all, it protects the HDL against inflammation, against oxidative stress. So when there is a decrease in POM, paraoxidase, also HDL will be damaged and will decrease. And then we can see that there is an increased inflammation, more oxidative stress. It's related to atherogenicity because atherogenicity is, you know, it's LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, but also, especially POM. POM protects the HDL and the LDL against the oxidation. 
and it's also related to the metabolic syndrome. Now, as you can see, in depression and in bipolar disorder, it's significantly decreased as compared with the normal controls. So that's another antioxidant enzyme which is decreased and which together with the staging forms one factor. So it means that this antioxidant enzyme is directly related to the staging and influenced by early lifetime trauma. Good, and from there we have a new staging of um, bipolar disorder and of depression. Maybe good to remember this too, because we found, again, with machine learning techniques, namely with PLS, this is computed with PLS, we found that there are three stages in the staging of um, depression and bipolar disorder. So, it starts with early lifetime trauma. And then early lifetime trauma increases the number of relapses, so the number of episodes increases, five episodes, 10, 20, 30 episodes. Um, and it also increases the number of suicidal attempts. And that's a stage one, so increased number of relapses. Stage two, what we see now, that's four years later, then we see that there is a decrease in the quality of life, more and more disabilities, and, remember this well, cognitive dysfunctions. So the cognitive dysfunctions are not here, but they come later. So it's an effect of the episodes. So the number of episodes induce more cognitive dysfunctions. Cognitive dysfunctions in executive functions, in uh, semantic memory, also episodic memory, but especially semantic memory is dysfunctional. That's stage two. And then we have a stage three, Stage 3 is this plus this, plus more suicidal behavior and more depressive episodes. So that's the end point. So patients who come here, I think suicide will be the big risk factor in those patients. And in fact, you can predict uh, this from this and this and this. So we can predict, in fact, who will commit suicide. Now, important is that it is related to paroxonase, so the, that antioxidant enzyme determines the whole pathway from here to here. In addition, early lifetime trauma induces oxidative stress and nitrosative stress has been shown. So it means that we have subjects with early lifetime trauma have more oxidative stress, nitrosative stress, low upon one, and thus a more important staging of this one. You see, it's all related. So, in fact, you can call it that POM1 and oxidative stress are also staging biomarkers. Good, but we are speaking about the uh, trigger factors for depression and uh, bipolar disorder. Smoking, you know, that's another factor. Smoking, as you can see here, there are many studies showing that smoking increases the prevalence of depression and bipolar disorder. How could this be? It's easy, huh? That's very easy. Because smoking, not the nicotine, but all the toxic products in cigarettes, increase oxidative stress, they increase inflammation, they increase the breakdown of epithelial cells, they induce lipid peroxidation, and they even induce necrosis. So we have there um, another pathway from smoking. Good, another pathway, that's the nutrition pathway. So, you see, when you're here, you have to think about this or this. It's a choice, huh? it's a choice you have to make. But I hope you will make a good choice after my presentation here. Because what's happening nowadays is that, okay, we look at the US, huh? here was the US. Look at this one, that the figures about obesity and overweight. 75%, 75%, that's enormous, huh? And then, when you look here, that's obesity. Obesity, I cannot read it from here, but it's around um, 35% now. And then expected, within 2030, it will be 50%. So it means 50% of the Americans will be obese, 
is BMI more than 30 in, the, in some years. Metabolic syndrome. And now you will see what's happening. Adipose tissue. What is this? What is this? That's inflammation. It's inflammation. So when you have this, you have an increase in interleukin 6, DNF, interleukin 1 beta. So adiposity and metabolic syndrome contribute to major depression and to bipolar disorder. And then something else. That's uh, what we call the guts, the leaky guts. Because it's possible that many disorders are induced by good problems. You know, we have one kilogram of bacteria here. In fact, we have we are more bacteria than human. But we have more bacterial cells than human cells. So, what's happening? So, we have the lumen in the gut. We have many bacteria, including gram-negative bacteria. You know, gram-negative bacteria with LPS, lipopolysaccharide, you know it. Yeah, so that, that's the wall of the bacteria. And RPS is very toxic because RPS induces uh, inflammation and oxidative stress. So we have a specific system in the gut to contain all those bacteria in the gut human. It's called, you see it here, the tight junctions. The tight junctions, you have to remember. Um, and then in some conditions, the tight junctions can open. So here you see a normal condition, only a few bacteria can translocate, it's called translocate, from the gut to the, the blood. But when they open, when the tight junctions are destroyed, bacteria can intrude into the blood. What do we have then? Then we have an increase in LPS in the blood. And LPS, okay, that's very not neurotoxic, it induces um, inflammation and oxidative stress. So we measured the LPS in blood, and in fact we are working on this paper now, yesterday, today, we are working on this. And then, uh, as you can see, in bipolar disorder 1 and major depression, there is an increase in LPS in plasma. So it means the bacteria are translocated to the plasma. We have more gram-negative bacteria in the plasma, again, as compared with BP2. You see, the differences are very consistent. And of course, as compared with normal controls. Good. And then we can go to some treatments. So this will take uh, three minutes to do. Um, first of all, antidepressants. So in uh, 1990, I don't remember, 98, I think, 95, we found that the antidepressants are immunosuppressants. They decrease inflammation and immune activation <coughs> by, for example, here, by decreasing interferon and very specifically increasing interleukin 10. So the immunosuppressive cytokines. And it's consistent for all antidepressants. Also for lithium, also for the mood stabilizers. They are all uh, immunosuppressants. Another one, you know this, curcumin. Curcumin, you see it's yellow, eh? so it's a yellow powder. And um, we did, we published two different RCTs, randomized uh, controlled trials, on curcumin, showing indeed that it has an effect on depression. So, combined with antidepressants, it will augment the activity of antidepressants. So, it means you can use it as an augmentation treatment for depression. Why? It's an antioxidant and it's anti-inflammatory and it's neuroprotective. But uh, we can use more things. That's another one. So that's omega-3. We can also use omega-3 to treat depression. And there are, I think now, 20 different studies showing that omega-3 can be used. Normally we use around one gram I would say 1.5 gram a day of EPA to treat depression. And again, it will augment the activity of antidepressants. We can also use zinc. So zinc has also been shown in RCTs that it has an antidepressant effect. Also folic acid, as you can see here, 
of folic acid has an uh, antidepressant effect. Even this, you have to read this, that's a diet, but it's not a diet from Bulgaria, I think. It's more the real Mediterranean diet. And as you can see, there is a study by Chaka, that's from uh, Geelong, in uh, Australia, where I'm also affiliated. And uh, as you can see, that's uh, social support only, but with Mediterranean diet, whoops, strong improvement in depression. See, diet has an effect. It can induce depression, or it is a vulnerability for depression, but you can also treat with diets. And then, something else that's American, they use anti-TNF. So that's the real immune therapy, it's itanacept. So that's the TNF receptor number two. So they injected this in the patients, and as you can see, it has also a significant antidepressant effect. So it seems everything that decreases uh, inflammation and oxidative stress can be used as an uh, antidepressant. Also statins, COX-2 inhibitors, and many, many more. And so we come to the last slide. That's a summary of what well, is depression now, and bipolar disorder. So in fact, they are disorders. And as you can see, serotonin is not included here. So, Personally, I don't believe in serotonin and in dopamine and in the neurotransmitters. I think it's really an immune disorder uh, with inflammation, immune activation, a decrease in antioxidants and oxidative stress. So that's a trio that comes together. Because when you have inflammation, you have oxidative stress. When you have a decrease in antioxidants, you have inflammation or oxidative stress. So they come together. Okay? Based on this, there will be damage by oxidative and nitrosative stress to your fatty acids, the pit peroxidation, to the proteins, your DNA, and also your mitochondria. And all those things together can lead to neurotoxicity, exitotoxicity, a decrease in neuroprotection, a decrease in neuroplasticity, a decrease in neurogenesis, a decrease in synaptic sampling. So, I mean, the whole neuronal cells will dysfunction due to uh, those oxidative markers and nitrosative stress. And that, of course, this can lead to major depression and bipolar disorder. So, that's a new view on depression and bipolar disorder. is not a, a typical interactive lecture. It's topical, it's focused, and therefore it's rather magistral and interactive. But yet I pushed a little bit the guest in order to, to have some time for you to address questions in order to, to open the floor for some questions. Uh, let me try to translate this entire story into something more propedeutical like. Well, for those of you who may see or not see uh, on, on the table, when speaking about affective disorders, uh, there must be some continuity which starts from generalized anxiety disorder, then it goes into major depressive disorder uh, and bipolar affective disorder. Well, the basic question is whether these three are different entities and whether this is a continuum of disorder which is strictly underpinned the specific biomarkers from the groups of nitro-oxidative stress and neuroinflammation biomarkers. My question would be how the two clusters of biomarkers can underpin the continuum of each of those clinical diagnoses. How would they interact with them? What kind of, of curve would they produce? 
in terms of cumulation uh, and uh, augmentation from, from the moderate or the mild disorder, which is the GAD, to, uh, to, to the major depressive disorder, if we assume it, that from the spectrum of affective disorders, this one should be the, uh, the, the most severe. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a uh, very difficult question, easy. <laughs> so, very, very difficult. <laughs> so, GED, um, we did this research one year ago. And uh, I thought, GED, I will find nothing because GED is a minor anxiety disorder, I thought. But after analyzing the data, I saw that GED is a very severe disorder with respect to oxidative stress and antioxidative stress. Very, very severe disorder. It's really true. So I, I was amazed to see those results. It means that we have there a very strong um, uh, disorder with oxidative and nitrosative stress compared with, for example, chronic fatigue syndrome, which is also a chronic uh, disorder. So now, um, yeah, we know that GED can be present and later bipolar disorder 2 and 1 and also major depression of comorbid with GED. In fact, many patients with uh, major depression have GED, and most patients with GED will develop major depression. So there are strong comorbidities. So I think that uh, the oxidative stress already present in GED will predispose to major depression, especially when the patients have genetic risks and psychological risks, for example, the ELPs. So it's a combination, it's multifactorial to so have the oxidative stress, but this is influenced by genetics and it's influenced by ELT and probably also by bacterial viral infections. Of all students, what the take home messages besides psychotherapeutic, besides psychopharmacological medication, augmentation of the pharmacological strategy should be considered with probiotics, with uh, supplementation, like zinc and others. Now, uh, we, you're welcome to, to address uh, Professor Myers. Anyone? Thank you for the lecture. Very complete. Um, you uh, explain how uh, you have uh, inflammatory markers, etc. These different conditions. Uh, so, is it safe to assume that people who are depressed and have these disorders they have some underlying infection or some inflammation? So, we need to find the cause of the inflammation to treat that. And is it safe to say that if you treat that, you, you will treat the depression or whatever? And the psychology is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you so, saw. Um, I told you some of the trigger factors or the causes of um, major depression and bipolar disorder. So we have ELTs, early lifetime trauma. So early lifetime trauma, especially when there are more than three or four, increase the risk for depression, suicide, even schizophrenia, and also medical disorders, by the way. It's not only mental disorders. And uh, the pathway is ELTs can induce oxidative stress and also the cortisol axis, and also inflammation. So those patients have already a sensitized, it's called sensitized, system, inflammation, immune activation, and also the cortisol axis. So upon a restress, so when there is another stress problem, for example with a virus or bacteria or lifetime um, stresses, then there will be a sensitized response, a higher response in all those systems. So you see, it can come from there. It comes in part from there. Also, genes, genes in the interleukin-1 are receptive, are related to depression. Interleukin-6 genes, haptoglobin genes, so all those inflammatory genes are related to depression too. And then, in addition, um, you, you, you saw the leaky gut data, leaky gut data, are bacterial infections. These are chronic infections present in the patient's with depression. They will also contribute to the inflammation and oxidative stress. 
Yeah, how to treat, how to treat. You can treat with antidepressants. Of course, they are anti-inflammatory. They are neuroprotective. They protect your, they have many different functions. They pro protect your mitochondria. They have an effect on the serotonin system, okay? But serotonin is an antioxidant. So it increases serotonin, which is an antioxidant. And you can combine the, because you know, the effic efficacy of antidepressants, do you know how much it is? In the first trial, according to the Singapore, to the NUS, it's 33% will respond favorably. So we have only a limited response to antidepressants. So I think it's best to combine, augment the activity of um, antidepressants with all the different things I showed you, omega-3, zinc, um, anti-TNF if you want, so, or other products, COX-2, inhibitors, or statins, all possible. Probiotics, that's true. Thank you very much. Are there other questions or comments or interventions? Regarding our little uh, regarding our little acts here, uh, with the um, respect of the um, generalized uh, anxiety disorder going into planning major depression, in between we have the bipolar disorder. And my question is, as we have seen uh, in the presentation, uh, the, different, the two different types of bipolar disorder have completely different uh, biomarkers. So which type would this be, or could it be either one of them? Uh, I'm sure yeah. I'm no, 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 I understand, I understand. <laughs> All right. I have to think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but uh, does the PP come between the two? It's, it's not needed that the GAD can, can go to MDD directly. Straight, that's possible. Or GAD can go to VG2 uh, directly and stop there. So it's not needed. I don't know. You have to tell me because I don't know. Is this really a continuum between G and D? Is assumption? Assumption, I have. Is it right assumption? Yeah, can be, yeah, can be. But of course, well, the question good question is the biomarker. Whether, uh, if MDD converts to BAD, mm -hmm. is question. Yeah. Does it convert to BAD1 or BAD2? Yeah. Based on, on, on the data, on the evidence. Which one? That's a very good question. Okay, <laughs> next year we will start new research. Very good. So, just you answer, I think. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Biomarkers, and uh, we noticed the difference between the bipolar one and bipolar two. Is it possible that there's also a difference in different types of depression as well? For example, between chronic depression and just normal mind or depressive episodes. Ah, yeah. Okay, that's not a very good question. And there are differences. So, for example, we have uh, simple major depression um, with and without melancholia. There are differences in melancholia. There are more disorders than in uh, major depression. Most severe. So there are differences there. Okay, um, but atypical depression also, but less than with melancholia. Chronic depression has also very specific, has specific profile. So in uh, chronic depression, you can see more autoimmune responses. So it seems that the autoimmune responses uh, can induce or are related to chronic depression. That's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, ERPs, um, I told 
you have, so EFTs um, induce, um, you know, they can induce oxidative stress, and they also induce uh, inflammatory reactions, for example, in IL-6, and in CRP, C-reactive protein, and also an increased activity of the cortisol axis, so the HPE axis. So this you have, also it's a vulnerability. Children with EFTs have an increased vulnerability for many different disorders due to those reactions. And um, it means that those systems, all those different systems, are sensitized. So open, restress, boom, then you have a very strong response in the three systems, leading probably to the pathophysiology of the disorders. Thank you for the lecture. Um, I had a question. You know how you mentioned about the diet? Um, you mentioned, I think it was flax or linseed. I've read some contradictory stories that say that that can actually, um, it can, because of the phytoestrogens, it can mimic estrogen and therefore that would worsen the case for like, uh, you know, for women who have got like menopause and stuff. So could you shed some light on that? Yeah, yeah. That's not a very difficult question. Um, in any case, uh, based on the results we have, I would say that uh, the best treatment for depression and bipolar disorder is the omega-3 uh, fatty acids that can reduce inflammation. I think that's important. So they should reduce inflammation. Now, there are different kinds of omega-3 fatty acids. So there is APA, mycosapentanoic acid, and there is DHA, dopusapentanoic acid. So these are different uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. But it's only APA that can reduce inflammation. So DHA, also omega-3, cannot reduce inflammation. So when you want to treat inflammatory disorders, like depression, and like schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder, and, and other medical disorders, like cardiovascular disorder, you need APA, and not the DHA. And not AA, because these are the omega-6. So you need a product very specific with high concentrations of APA and low doses of DHA and omega-6. So that's very important. Um, DHA, for example, can be used for because DHA goes to the brain and it's very important for the structure of the brain. So this you can use, for example, for attention deficit disorder. That's a very good treatment for attention deficit disorder. So you see, there are differences already. Then, flaxseed oil, because this was your question too, and flaxseed oil. Flaxseed oil is a combination of especially um, omega-3 versus omega-6, so the, the ratio is 4 to 1 for um, APAs and uh, 1 uh, omega-6. So that's a good ratio. That's what we need. Huh? So, for example, in Japan, the ratio between omega-3 and omega-6 is 1 to 1. That's good. But uh, the higher the omega-3 ratio versus omega-6, the better. So, if you drink daily flaxseed oil, then you have a good omega-3 level of APA. So, that's mm -hmm. fantastic for inflammatory diseases. So, the more medicine, the like, more the imbalance of the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your participation, for your attendance. I believe uh, Professor Mass is uh, available for more or less informal approach after we close the class. According to your program, it has to be closed now. And uh, I would like to once again thank you for your attendance. <laughs>